In mid-February 1943, near Sidi Bouzid in Tunisia, a captured American M4A1 Sherman tank rolled to a halt in the soft desert sand. Its white U.S. Army star was still visible beneath the freshly painted German Balkenkreuz. Officers from Heavy Panzer Battalion 501 crowded around their unexpected prize, already opening notebooks and inspecting its features. This single, intact Sherman, seized during the fighting around Sidi Bouzid, would begin a chain reaction inside the German technical establishment. It shattered long-held assumptions and triggered an internal crisis among German engineers, one that would influence their tank development for the rest of the war. The revelation was not about firepower or armor thickness, but about something Germany had never prioritized, automotive reliability on an industrial scale. Painted on the tank's hull was the name War Daddy II, with the serial number USA 3067641. It had been built by Lima Locomotive Works and assigned to Company G, 1st Armored Regiment, 1st Armored Division. German reconnaissance troops decided to drive the tank rather than dismantle it. They took it more than 350 kilometers across harsh North African terrain to the port of Sfax, a four-and-a-half-day journey. Every kilometer of the trip revealed something new and deeply troubling to German crews. The engine never overheated. The transmission did not hiccup. The final drives, notorious weak points on many German tanks, ran smoothly without complaint. Veteran German drivers, accustomed to stopping every few kilometers to address mechanical issues, watched this foreign tank run day after day without needing a single repair. By the time it reached Sfax, the German Army Weapons Office had already issued strict orders. This tank must reach Germany intact and in working order. Transported across the Mediterranean, the Sherman arrived at the Kummersdorf Proving Grounds, the German Army's primary testing facility located south of Berlin. Engineers assigned it the code Versuchsfahrzeug 259 and issued it a German registration number. When it rolled off the rail car, every plate of armor was already marked with chalked-on measurements and angle notations. Teams of specialists photographed the vehicle from all angles and examined every system using precision instruments. They noted the simplicity of its construction, almost disturbingly simple by German standards, and used as much civilian automotive manufacturing practice as military design. The transmission immediately drew attention. German tanks used straight-cut gears machined to extremely tight tolerances gears that required constant adjustment and a skilled driver to operate without damage. In contrast, the Sherman used herringbone gears, a design that spread mechanical stress more evenly and greatly reduced wear. German industry had long considered herringbone gears too demanding to mass produce, yet America was producing them by the thousands. Testing began with basic mobility trials. Engineers measured fuel consumption, monitored engine temperature, and drove the Sherman through demanding obstacle courses. After each run, they disassembled components to examine wear. To their growing discomfort, the Sherman not only performed well in every category, it excelled in durability. It ran for long stretches without the maintenance German tanks required. The Continental R975 radial engine, originally derived from aircraft designs, maintained stable performance under conditions that would have caused overheating or power loss in many German engines. Its cooling system, though simple, was effective. Its air filter did not clog even after prolonged operation in sandy environments, one of the major issues German units had faced in North Africa. The differences in design philosophy became impossible to ignore. The Sherman used a five-speed transmission with synchronization in four of the gears, making the tank far easier to drive. American engineers assumed ordinary drivers with basic training would operate these machines. 
German engineers assumed every tank crew would be a highly trained specialist, an unrealistic expectation under wartime conditions. In June 1943, an armaments demonstration took place at the Hillersleben Artillery Range, attended by Reich Minister Albert Speer and high-ranking Wehrmacht officers. A Sherman was lined up beside a newly produced Panther Alsif D and a massive Ferdinand tank destroyer. During hill climbing trials, the Sherman performed its task effortlessly, climbing the test slope with smooth gear changes and steady engine power. The Panther managed the climb, but only with difficulty. The Ferdinand, representing the peak of German technical complexity, stalled partway and required a recovery team to restart it. The embarrassment was obvious, and the message unmistakable. Speer's later memoirs described Shermans in Italy climbing mountains that German experts had deemed inaccessible to tanks. Reports from the 26th Panzer Division confirmed this advantage, noting the Shermans' excellent power-to-weight ratio and solid cross-country performance. A public article in Das Reich on June 27, 1943, cautiously praised the Sherman as a remarkable accomplishment of American industry. Even this understated praise masked the anxiety growing inside German technical offices. Through summer and autumn 1943, Kummersdorf engineers continued testing captured Shermans. They recorded operational ranges exceeding 2,000 kilometers before major maintenance, four times what early Panthers achieved. The Sherman's drivetrain showed lower power loss than German transmissions. Its final drives, built with the same herringbone principle, rarely failed. German Panther final drives, derived from the Tiger system, routinely broke under stress, often disabling tanks in under 200 kilometers of movement. Internal reports circulated through technical departments by late 1943, painting a stark picture. The U.S. automotive industry, supported by millions of civilian cars on American roads, had developed machinery that prioritized durability, mass production, and ease of repair. Germany, with relatively little civilian automotive infrastructure and a culture of precision engineering, had designed tanks that were powerful on paper but fragile in practice. The Sherman's components, built by Ford, Chrysler, Buick, and Caterpillar to identical standards, were fully interchangeable. German manufacturers could not achieve this consistency. The result was that American tanks stayed operational far longer in the field. More captured Shermans arrived from Italy and the Eastern Front through 1943 and 1944. Engineers examined British Firefly conversions as well, noting how easily the Sherman's large turret ring accommodated the powerful 17-pounder gun, evidence of growth potential the Panther lacked. Comparative reliability trials revealed devastating numbers. Throughout 1943, Panther operational readiness often hovered below 40 percent. During the Battle of Kursk, only 16% of Panthers were operational at a given time, with far more loss to breakdowns than to Soviet fire. Even with improvements, Panther engines averaged only 700 to 1,000 kilometers of service life, barely a third of what a Sherman diesel engine could achieve. Panther transmissions suffered frequent failures, especially in third gear, and final drives were notorious weak spots. Drivers were warned not to reverse while turning, not to shift too 